This program is all about providing leaders and managers with meaningful insights on how to optimize business results by aligning their people strategy to their business strategy. Our goal is to support you as you rise to the challenges of complex decision making centered around attracting and retaining top talent. We're going to begin with this beautiful singing and after pastor will pray. You may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain or to walk the mighty street? of gold, or to hear the angels sing, is it just a drink from the fountain that never shall run dry, or just darkness he came along and brought me the light he's been my closest friend down through the years and every time I cry he dried all my tears it's been worth just having the Lord in my life living in this world of darkness darkness Good to see all of you here. It looks to me that all of you had a wonderful lunch. I'm looking around and I see a few smiles and I know that you enjoyed the culinary delicacies that we had downstairs. It was really good. Um, some of you had soup, all kind of different soups and different cake, carrot cake and you name it. And um, It's just been a wonderful day. We had a great message this morning uh, by... Uh, Professor Dr. Bishop Jamie Pottinger. Nobody's listening to me. And, and um, he deserved his lunch because he went down there and he ate quite a bit. He got more than I did because he did more than I did. And um, he looks the happier for it. He has a great smile. And this evening we're here not because we didn't have anywhere else to go, but we're here because we wanted to listen to a man who has honed his craft in terms of leadership. He's a leadership guru, if you please. One who has um, dedicated his life to, to learning more about how to coach individuals who need to be great leaders. And he himself um, has become an expert in the, during the process because of hard work, diligent labor. And this evening, he's going to present to us a very special uh, uh, presentation on leadership and um, I believe that all of us need to learn something. So I would hope that you would have your notebooks handy with a pen or a pencil. You can have your notebooks and have no pen or pencil. That's a problem unless you're going to type it in on your Chromebook. Or some of you may have photographic memories. Then in that case, you don't need any of the above. You just remember what you hear. So this evening, we're going to welcome um, a life coach, a, a uh, leadership coach, uh, everything coach. He just knows it all and he does it all. And by the way, beside him is his lovely wife, Shauna Kay. 
she does a great job of feeding him every day and uh, getting him ready for each day. And he reciprocates, I'm sure. So, ladies and gentlemen, help me uh, welcome none other than uh, Jamie Pottinger. Come on, put your hands together as he comes forward. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a wonderful time this this morning, and um, you know, I went downstairs and I and after looking at the nice smiles and everything, I believe that everyone had a good time. I, I, I passed the ER right said that I ate I ate more than he did, but when I looked at his plate, he had more serving than I did. So so I don't know if maybe I made more shoes or some, but but you know, let's we're going to discuss that later on. I want to take this opportunity um, to thank all you guys for being here this evening. Uh, the journey for me has been one that has had ups and downs, challenges up and down. And, but guess what? The greatest thing is to face, face what you have in life and make the best use of the opportunity that you're given. Even if you believe that you're on the wrong side of the street, once you're confident in where you're heading, things will be made different. Um, I'm so grateful for, for Rehoboth Church. Um, I know that a few members were on my presentation recently. Um, the face of leadership conference that we had that was recently recently concluded we talked about the face of leadership um, the face of leadership where you know talk about you know we all deal with failure we all deal with foresight we also talk about awareness and whether or not we're aware of what we're doing and then the next thing is agility and whether or not we have that agile agile mindset in terms of winning and then after agility the terms is that whether you're confident so if you have clarity in terms of what you're doing and then energy and execution. But today, as I think about what we do here, I want to talk about, you know, just bouncing back from, is this ready on the screen? I want us to talk about collaboration and why is it so important as a church, as a group, in terms of leadership, why is it important for us to collaborate? You know, when I think about it this way is that if I think that I'm the best, I'm the best singer in this room, I may, do a lot of, I may do a lot of good by saying that I'm the best singer, but if we all come together as great people, guess what happens? We'll produce something that is better than what I would have produced by myself. So collaboration is the most, one of the most important tools that we can use in terms of pushing things forward. But what we're going to do before we go forward, I'm going to say a word of prayer. They're going to jump into a Bible verse because we're going to keep it in the context of the church. You know, when I'm, a, I'm always happy when I'm in places like these because guess what? I can talk about leadership things in front of my people and talk about God in the middle of it. So we're going to spend the next, I think, 49 minutes diving into it, the art, the power, unleashing the power of collaboration and how that impacts you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your divine guidance. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, it was about 15 years ago, I, find myself, I found myself at Northern Caribbean University, and I was on the campus. And I was on campus, um, um, Henry, and, and I felt so confident that I was ready to win. I was ready to win big. I was there. Everybody thought that I was smart. I was leaving my countryside home, and I went to a big campus, and that was the first time Northern Cabin University had that many new students who were attending the university. And I was jumping twilight. I was ready because I was focused that, guess what? I'm going to be the person who's going to change the fortune of my family. As far as I'm concerned, I'm coming from a family of eight siblings, and I'm going to be the first to finish college and give all my younger siblings an opportunity to be rich and to be famous and to be wealthy. That was my mindset. So I was there in campus, I was moving through, and then guess what happens? It seems as if every time when you have something in your mind to do, somebody always have the audacity of popping your balloon. So I found myself in the auditorium, and I was there, and I remember as if it was yesterday, I was standing in the auditorium and, and I think the registrar stood and she said to us, look to your left, look to your right. And then she said, I guarantee you that almost 15% of those of you guys who are in this auditorium will not make it to graduation. At that point, the same confident, energetic Jamie just stopped thinking. Right there, I said to myself, she was speaking to me. How on earth could I make it through college? Eight siblings, a father finished, high, finished school at ninth grade, my mother a pre-trained teacher, and I found myself in college. I couldn't afford to stay in the dorm. I'm now, I, I'm now away from home. I went home, Elta, and I said to myself, I'm going to wave the white flag in the face of failure. I called home, but I forgot twilight that I'm leaving home, and, 
And where I knew to be home for the last, what, 16 years, we're no longer home. We're out of a house, so if I'm going back home, I'm going back home, and I'll be robbing one of my siblings of their space on the bed. So there was no such thing as home. I went to my first class, and I was in my first class, and while I was in my first class, I remember, I'm like, I don't belong. As I looked around Elta, people were popping out their laptops and, and their computers, and they were using words about their memory stick and their memory chips, and I was like, come, come wish pewter. I had neither of the syllabus. And, 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 and I was there, and I was... I was astonished. I was like, nah, I really don't belong. And, and, and we're talking about the power of collaboration and how important it is whereby we need people to win. In this church, you may believe that because we're a church, I need to be isolated. There's no winning unless you have people on your side. There's no self-made millionaire. There's no self-made believer. They have to at least pray to God. In everything that we do that is great, it requires relationship. If you can tell me one thing that you have done that is great, that had nothing to do with anybody or anything else that helped you to get there, please, I'll take this book and I'll trash it and I'll write a new one. So I found myself there and I know you guys are wondering, so how did you get to this point? So while I was there and I finished my first class, I remember we were doing Word Perfect and I was sitting in the class and, and everybody knew what was happening. Everybody knew how to cut, paste and control A, highlight everything. I knew nothing. And I remember I walked to the cafeteria, and while I was in the cafeteria, I was like, this is my last supper, my last meal, before I asked somebody to just transport me home. And I was sitting there, and I remember it like yesterday, a young lady by the name of Mary Jackson, she came and she tapped me on the shoulder, and she said to me, excuse me, would you like to join us for lunch? And I'm like, me, lunch? Anyhow, I'm going to shake the devil and speak the truth. She was a beautiful young lady. I'm not saying no. At least, I have, you know, at least I'm in some good company, right? So, so this brother here took himself and went with them. And, and I could remember it. I remember it was Colin. It was Mary. It was Simon. It was Bruce. It was Raquel and Roxanne. It was Colin. Dussum. I remember everybody was around that table. And as I sat at that table, my life changed in that moment. Because right there, this kid who had nothing to do, nobody to move to, nowhere to go. I had nobody before me in my immediate family who finished college to give me any perspective on what to do. And I sat there and, 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 and they said to me, Jamie, what are you doing later? We will be at the library. Do you have a computer? No, I don't. Okay, I have a printer. You can stop by my dorm. Jamie, I don't like the calf food. Here's my calf card. You can hang and get meals here. Everything changed in that minute. You see, I'm a, I'm a product of collaboration. You know, and when people stop and say, I'm the best thing since sliced bread, we are only the best thing when there's some butter on us or some cheese or if you eat meat. And that was my meat right there. So when it comes down to whatever you do, as you think about walking in the path that God has created for you, whether in your personal life, in your relationships, whatever it is, it takes collaboration to be successful. There's nothing, there's nothing on this earth that beats having strong, good relationships. You see, you may think that you can bring people to Christ or you could bring people to becoming your friend unless they see some value in what you're doing. And when you bring them to you, they take you to places that you've never been before. So the power of collaboration. So for the next um, 30, 50 minutes, we'll be talking about the power of collaboration and why is it important to, to connect with people and do what is great. And I'm going to start off with this, this text in, in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, it said, 42, it said, They devoted themselves to the, to the apostles, teaching, and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and of prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had nothing. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. You see, many times we ask ourselves this question, why is it that I'm still at the same level that I've been for the last 25 years? You know, you see people sometimes, they're in the job and they've been in the same position in the same job for 25 years. Or you may be in a relationship and you are in the same place that you were when you said, I do at the altar. The thing about it is that the question is, are you collaborating? Are you connecting with others and gaining the value that they have to offer? Sometimes we believe that all greatness is in ourselves and, and there's nothing, there's nothing 
Look, when you open your mouth to speak, you're only reminding yourself of what you know. When you open your ears to listen, you're taking in something new that you did not know before. But what happened to us most times, we are so believing in ourselves, we keep talking, we keep moving, and we rob ourselves of the opportunity of collaborating. Collaboration, teamwork, is the greatest tool that you can use to accelerate your path to anything that you're looking to achieve. Whether in the world, in the church, in your relationship, whatever it is. But I want to open the mic for a quick second. You can stay with you and answer this. Why is collaboration such an important thing in whatever you're doing in life? Anybody, everybody. I'd like to get at least three persons or four persons sharing how important or why is it important for you to collaborate? Communication and dialogue is important for our everyday life. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm going to come back to that. I like that. Communication and dialogue is important for our everyday lives. Anybody else? In the back one we have over here. Gain new ideas. That's beautiful. Uh, Dreamwork is the teamwork. Dream work. Teamwork, it, teamwork is the dream work. Teamwork is a dream work. Yes, it works. There's that, no I in team. Ooh, I like that. No I in team. When we, when we, when we think about, I, I, I'm going to share this. I'm going to give you another part of my story. So I found myself in the lab at one point. My, one of my best friends, his name is Luigi Allen. He works at Microsoft. And I was hanging in the lab one Sunday, and I was on the computer, and I was hitting away on the computer, trying to finish my computer program because I was a programming major. Trying to get that joker wrapped up before, before the lab closed on a Sunday. And I wanted to have some good time too. And he walked over to me and he said to me, communication. He said, what's your name? I, I felt like being country at that point. Like, hey, don't ask me no name, man. Get out of here. Get out of my face. And something said to me, hey, just be cool. You don't have to be all, all macho about this thing. And I said, hey, my name is Jamie Pottinger. He said, fine. How long have you been here? I said, I'm a freshman. He said, do you have a computer? I said, no. He said, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, work. He said, okay, you want to swing by my house? I said, fine. Swung by his house, he gave me a computer. You see, communication and sharing where you are, but what happens sometimes, we are on a platform where we believe that if we share our weaknesses, if we share our gaps, it makes us look less than who we are. But not until you are comfortable in accepting the fact that you have gaps, you have weaknesses, you have need, and you need help, that's the only way, because guess what? You'll never ever be blessed in your fake state. I hope somebody here heard that. You'll never ever be blessed in your fake state. If I say to you that, are you hungry? You tell me that you have a refrigerator full of food. I'm going to give that check to the person who said they're hungry. Tough luck. And many times because we are so fearful, we want to be on the stage by ourselves and join the spotlight. We fail to collaborate when really and truly we should be connecting. You see... The lack, when, when you fail to collaborate, there are three things that happens. You end up wasting time. Because when you, when you fail to collaborate, it's like writing that paper and you're not the best at writing. And Twyla is better at writing. But because you want to get all the praises for yourself, you spend the entire night in the corner trying to do something that you're not the best at. When you could connect with Twyla, and Twyla would have t shared with you exactly how to structure a paragraph. And then before you know it, in 30 minutes, you'd have gotten done something that would take you an hour. And many times what happens in our Christian life, in our businesses, in our career, and in our journey... We spend, the ex we spend our entire lives trying to prove to everybody that I can do it by myself when you could just connect with somebody else and gain the support and help. Because remember this, a talent earned can never be taken away. So if Twyla want to share with somebody that I'm the reason why Jamie can write, she cannot come back to me and take away my writing skills. So, so the pride that we have prevents us from collaborating and take ourselves to the next level. And we want to stay in that mind. The next thing is that a lack of innovation. You know, I, I, I've, been, I've been through a lot of organization, whether speaking or coaching. And one of the things that I find out is that the groups, the leaders, and the teams who collaborate and connect, guess what happened to them? They are the ones who grow the fastest. When I walk into a group and the person is like, we got it. We got We Don't worry about that. We got it. Jamie, don't worry about that. We, we got it. But when I walk into a group and the person is like, you know what, Jamie, we made this amount of money last year, but we have some gaps. 
And in my head, first I would say like, nah, this person is being arrogant. Because at first I'm like, I was still locked in that mindset that once you're making it, make it, make it, you don't need help. But I found out that the people who are doing the best are the ones who are looking for opportunities to collaborate. If you think about Steph Curry, he has a coach. Michael Jordan, on the summertime, he'll have several people collaborating with. Why is it that we believe that as a people, because we have made $10, we are now made men? No, no. So, so you just got a job that pays you $50,000 and you, 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 un, you unfriend all the people who assisted you because you're now on the mountaintop. But, but guess what happens to us, guys, is that when we fail to collaborate, we remain on the small roofs like pigeons and we never ever make it to the mountaintop like the eagles. And guess what happens? We keep that small lungs and we can't breathe the altitude in because we don't know how to do it. You have to be able to tell yourself, I don't know how to do it. And it's all based in scriptures. Whereby, the more you think that you have is the less you have. The less you think you have is the more you know you need. And the more you know you need is the easier it is for you to seek help. But if I don't think I need help, then I don't seek help. Let's put it in a Christian context. You know, you may be working on a Bible verse and, and you don't know what it's saying. And the pastor is preaching, look at you, amen preacher. Amen preacher. It's like my, 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 my grandmother once, she heard something in church and she didn't repeat it well. And she said that, I'm, 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 she said that, I'm heavenly minded and earthly no good. And she, certain that she was certain that she was saying something good. <laughs> but she was just repeating what she heard. But what happens is that when you collaborate, you develop that confidence in sharing what you don't have or what you don't know. And when you do that, guess what? People are more willing to assist people who are willing to share that they have emptiness. You are more willing to assist somebody who's not cocky or arrogant or self-serving than you are somebody. So I remember once somebody looked at me and I was dying for hunger on campus. I was, I was hungry. And the person said to me that, you know what? I thought about giving you a gift card, but guess what happened? The way you walk on campus, man, I thought you were a made man. If he only knew that, that look, I would crawl on my knees to get that gift card. But my disposition was one that I wasn't willing to collaborate. You know, so what I do now is that when I find myself in the airport and I'm sitting beside somebody, if I'm going to sleep, I even apologize that I'm going to be sleeping. Because I can't afford to miss an opportunity of tapping into somebody who could pour into me. So, so when, you, when you think about life, you think about growth, you think about your church, when you think about where you're heading, you think about the fact that, just remember this, I'm not enough. There's always something more that could be poured into me to give me just enough. And just as I have enough, I've just gotten enough to give more to somebody else. Because Maya Angelou said it like this. She said, and I'm paraphrasing, when we get, we give, and when we learn, we teach. So, so the more you get, the more you release, and the more you release, the more room you have to receive, and then you're constantly growing and expanding. But what happens to us is that, one of the reasons why we are fearful of collaborating, because guess what? In our comfort space, we don't have to do anything different. But I'm telling you that, I remember I was playing soccer for a long time and I'd stopped. But what I didn't know that I was still playing it in my mind. So I went by the court and I saw the guys playing soccer and I ran on the field to play some soccer and I, and I moved off at a hundred miles per hour. But the only place that was moving was my brain. Uh, you, you ever watch those old cartoons that Tom and Jerry and he's speeding up and, and then he shoots off. So I knew, I, 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 my brain was going a thousand miles an hour and the last thing I remember I was flat on my face. And I got back up and I was doing the same thing. Sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that we are better than we actually are. And, and it calls for humility. And, and people who are humble about where they are, they will always keep learning. But I'd like to ask this question. When you, when you fail to... You, 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 you've seen people who they have experienced, you call it the one-hit wonders. They do something great and nothing else happened afterwards. And you're like, what happened? He had a hit song. Yeah, that was the only thing he had in his tank. Because guess what? That person went to the studio and they believed that they were the best thing. And they failed to collaborate with other entertainers. And hence, their little one lion gif did its turn on the billboard. And then guess what? That was it for them. 
Failure to create meaningful and sustainable solutions and growth. You know, not anybody can do something good at any given point. But only great people who are collaborating can sustain that growth. I'm going to say this. Anybody on a good day can do something great. Think about it. On a good day, I could give you a nice C sharp. I could give you something high. Nice. You hear me in the show, you're like, wow, does Mike, the Jackson fight back in swing? You're like, but then guess what? If you ask me to do it twice because I'm not collaborating and practicing, a, and that wasn't a fake, that was real. Because I tried to do it this morning and I, I, did, I did a few good notes to start, but right now I'm just like, there's nothing left. But, but, but that's what happened when I, you know, so if I was collaborating and practicing and connecting before now, I'd be able to do it on a more consistent basis and I wouldn't be worried about my song for later on. But that's what collaboration is. But, but my next thing is this, is winning with people. I'm going to throw this out to you because one of the things that's happening in the church and with leadership now is that we are so fearful of connecting with people. Why is it such an important thing? Oh, can we really win without people? Anybody else? Any ideas on that area? Winning with people. I should be using this, right? Winning with people. Is there any other way to win? Anybody? With God? Okay, I love that. With love? With God, with love, I love that. Anybody else? With training. You know the funny thing about this, guys? Learning. Even if you have God, you having God is for you to collaborate with others and share the love of God. There's no value, there's no value in anything that you have unless you're sharing it with somebody else. It's almost like you're watching a nice movie and you wish you could have somebody you're watching with. You can't wait to tell your friend. Or you're having a nice lick of ice cream and you're like, whoa, I can't wait to tell that person where that nice ice cream is. That's what we were, we were made to connect. We were made to collaborate. And the thing about it is that when we collaborate, when we release that power of collaboration, then we win and we win big. Many of us, the reason why we are stagnant is because we have failed to collaborate. So, I'm going to jump the gun real quickly here. And I'm going to show you two persons. And I know they're not believers, but the story is meaningful. Okay. So if you know me, I love basketball. Now my first love with sports is concerned. But these two players are two players that I admire. But I admire number eight more than I, more than I do 23. Forgive me. For all the 23 fans in the building. Uh, forgive me. But, but, but I want to share a quick story with you here. The story is told when, when Michael Jordan, on Michael Jordan's video, where he had the last dance that came out on Netflix. It is said when they interviewed Kobe Bryant, they said, Kobe Bryant said when he came in the league, people told him that he could not talk to Michael Jordan because Michael Jordan said he was, they called Michael Jordan the black Jesus. When people talked to Michael Jordan, he would give them, they, they said that he would give them fake numbers. But Kobe Bryant, because he wanted so badly to be better than who he was, Kobe Bryant would stay, when they went to play against the Chicago Bulls, he would stand outside the arena until Michael Jordan was the last person coming out just to talk with him. Kobe Bryant recognized that he was average. Kobe Bryant recognized that Michael Jordan had something that he needed. Kobe Bryant recognized that if collaborating meant that he would have to humble himself as a rookie and learn from the Godfather, he was willing to do it. The rest is history. Kobe Bryant was drafted as the overall 13th pick. But guess what happened? Kobe Bryant is now considered a legend of the game. You see, one of the things that prevents us from growing and collaborating is a pride that we have inside. We can't afford for you to tell me that the reason why you're doing good is because I helped you. One of the reasons why we find it hard to grow is because we find it hard to tell somebody that, guess what? I have weaknesses. I have gaps. I'm struggling. But when you get to that place where you could accept that you're weak, you accept that you're struggling, you accept that you don't have the best move on whatever you're doing, then people now feel comfortable to share. Just remember this. People always want to feel better about themselves. 
And the easiest way to allow somebody to be, feel better about themselves is to give them an opportunity to talk about what they can do for you. So whether you get a new job or whatever, walk up to that drummer and say to him, that drummer, I heard you on them drums, man. It's sick. Can you show me a few things? If you show people that you value what they have, they will give you more than what you need. i repeat that. If you show people that you value what they have, they will give you more than what you need. You know, I, I, I remember recently, as soon as I was finished writing this book, I was, I was in a conversation with a few people where they're chatting. And I was the lowest of the pedigree in that room. And I was there talking and somebody said to me, Jamie, you need to learn how to promote yourself. So while we're having a conversation, I was there talking and I, I, I went back to my cultural piece. You know, sometimes you have that sense that if you're better than where you are, cut it out. So I was in that mind frame where I felt like I was better than where I'm at. And if they need to connect with me, they need to find me. Who do I think I am? So I was there because we all get into those spaces sometimes where you think that you are that in a bag of chips. So while I was there crunchy like a bag of chips, you know, somebody a part of that conversation who I've connected with before, this is what a person said to the person who had power and prestige. Hey, by the way, have you met Jamie? Oh yeah, I've spoken to Jamie before. You know that Jamie released a new book, right? Really? The person said, you need to get him to speak for you. Really? You have, a con you have a function coming up. Yes, you're right. This is the person. Jamie, are you available on the 16th? Here, Jamie. Yes, I'm available. Jamie, how can I get some of those books? Whenever you want them. <laughs> Jamie, can you get me 40 books? I want you to sign them all. To okay, yes, I could do that. And right there, even though I was acting like I was a bag of chips or more, thank God there was somebody in that group that I didn't act that way to. And because we collaborated, that person grandfathered me into a relationship and walked me right into a conference. A conference that I could not have gotten myself into even if I was six feet taller. I got in, got a nice seat, great treatment, and they bought books. And they want me to do more stuff for them. I'm saying that collaboration can take you from the lowest point to the highest point. Because guess what? If you are not on the table, you're on the menu. I'm going to repeat. You know, you guys are going to get that later, but that's all right. If you are not at the table, you are on the menu. And most of my life, I spend it on the menu. Look, if you are, let's put it this way. If you are not in the kitchen, you're in the pot. So you, you make your mind where you want to be. But what collaboration does, collaboration puts you in places that you'd have not normally been a part of. Because what happens when you collaborate, for example, look at it this way. Elta is working for a Fortune 500 company. I'm just doing a regular job. But because Elta and I have collaborated and we have a relationship, Elta walks into her group and said to her group, that guess what? I know Jamie Pottinger. This is what they say. Elta, if you know him, we know him. If you want him, we want him. If you think he's good, he's good. If Elta says he needs to be sitting up front, he needs to be sitting up front. If Elta said he should pay us $100,000, Elta said it. Guys, it is that simple. Let's bring it back to our Christian context. Many times we miss opportunities of bringing people to Christ or to good things because we fail to collaborate. And the reason, one of the reasons why we fail to collaborate is that sometimes we think that we have more than what we really have. We're talking to somebody and I'm talking to the person as if I'm close, as if Jesus and I are first cousins and he's a second cousin. But if I said to that person, you know what? Both of us are second cousins to, to what's happening. And we have common ground. Then guess what? You're going to be like, you know what, Jamie? Let me walk over to church with you. We're in the same part. But oftentimes, we strive so hard to prove how different we are, not to show that we are part of, people don't want to be a part of us. And, and, and if you think that something that is just happening here is something that happens everywhere else. When I, when I meet with leadership groups, when I meet with top teams, that is the very same challenge that they have in terms of collaborating. You know, let me look at my time. So now we have 29 minutes to go. And I'm going to jump to something else that we have to do. You know, one of my favorite chapters in this book is the chapter on awareness. 
I like failure too, but I like awareness. And, you know, John Maxwell said it this way. You talk about collaborating. He said this. If you don't know yourself, you cannot grow yourself. I'll repeat that. If you don't know yourself, you cannot grow yourself. One of the reasons why we fail to thrive spiritually, why we fail to, th to thrive in society, why we fail to thrive financially, is because we neither know our environment, nor do we know ourselves. And many of us, we are on the right highway, but guess what? We're heading in the wrong direction. You know, I can remember I was in a, a meeting, and... Um, I was in the right space, I, I met some nice people, having great conversation, and the person asked me one question. He said this to me, Jamie, what is it that you want out of life? And it took me almost 10 minutes to share what I wanted out of life. The guy looked at me and he said something to this sort, Jamie, I'm not trying to disrespect you, but you don't know yourself. That changed the entire conversation. Because when you know where you are, when you know where you're going, then guess what that aids with collaborating. Because if I know who I am, it's easy for me to collaborate with you. Because I'm not ashamed of who I am. So my question is, are you open knowing what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your gaps are, and what your opportunities are? Many of us in the faith as believers, we, we know that we are Seventh-day Adventists. We know that we are mothers. We know that we are fathers. But that's where it ends. And because that's where it ends, guess what happened? We end up missing out on a bunch of opportunities. We miss out on opportunities to witness. We miss out on opportunities to grow ourselves financially. We miss out on opportunities for personal health and care. Because we don't know who we are, where we are, or what we really need. We say we do, but really and truly, many of us are walking in somebody else's shoes, heading in their direction, and we're going to end up at their destination. The last thing I want to do with my life is that at the end of it, I found myself, I find myself at somebody else's doorstep thinking that I'm at home. You know, when, when, when I, and, and one of the, one of the misconceptions that we have as believers, you know, when I set out to write the book, The Face of Leadership, somebody asked me the question, Jamie, why are you writing The Face of Leadership? Why are you writing that book? And the reason why I wrote this book, as I share with you, and I shared a few other conferences, is that I wrote this book because I recognize that many of us felt like we weren't leaders because of the way we look or where we're coming from. So when I thought about it, I said to myself, the reason why we think like that is because we are not aware of our innate strengths and capacity to do great things. So because you allow the image that is painting of you to determine where you head, then when it's time for you to connect, you say, for example, Wayne Henry pops up and Wayne Henry has something great to offer. Because your concept of self is less than who you are, you say to him that you're not ready. I hope, I, I wish I had somebody listening to me here today. So, 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 so Wayne walks up to me and Wayne says to me that, I have a gig for you to play next week at T.D. Jake's church. You know what he starts saying, you know what, I have a dentist appointment that day. By the way, I forgot to tell you, I, I need to pick my daughter up. I know my wife is sick. You're lying. Because of your lack of confidence, in who you are and your awareness of your capacity to be great, you turn down the opportunity to move forward. Because what happens to us when we are not aware of ourselves is that we get stuck in our comfort zone. And, I, and, I, and this is one of my favorite lines and I use it every time I speak. Most of us, we like to be in the rocking chair mode. And the rocking chair, what it does for us is that it takes us backward and forward, but it takes us nowhere. So what happens is that we get a glimpse of what's beyond and we come back. It's like, this is it. And, and, and you know what? We miss out on everything that's there. So guess what happened? We miss out on opportunities to stretch ourselves. And when you don't stretch, you can't grow. And when you can't grow, you become stagnant. When you become stagnant, you become polluted. When you're polluted, mosquitoes take up that pond. It means that you're no longer flowing because streams flowing get a chance to see the mountainside. But when you are in a reservoir mindset, you're not flowing. You're contaminated. And you are celebrating what you have done before. Not knowing that there are greater and deeper depths for you to go. Because the real journey comes when you make it to the ocean. 
You know how many of us we are so locked into the pond and the lakes and we don't know what is ahead of us? And then because we are there, guess what? We are afraid to collaborate. And the reason why we are afraid to collaborate is because we know that others have gone and they have seen the mountainside. And because they know the terrain, we are like, nah, I'm not ready for that game yet. You know, one of the greatest, one of the things that I share with, with some of my folks who I work with, is that one of the greatest gifts you can give to yourself is a gift of awareness. I recommend that everybody in this group, in my voice, before the weekend is out or next week, do a behavioral assessment in terms of who you are. You need to confront who you are. Because sometimes who you are is so close to where you are, but because of who you are, you can't recognize who you really are. So, so I, I, let, me, let me break it down. I don't know if you've ever heard the story of the Acres of Diamond. The, the story is told of this guy, whereby he heard about the diamond rush. And he was hunting for diamonds and, and he had a nice huge property and he sold the entire property looking for diamond. And, and you know what he did? He went far to find diamond. And when he was done, his money was done and everything. I think he went on a bridge and allowed the waves to come and, and waves took him away. So guess what happened? He sold the property to this guy. So this guy's home now and this guy's sitting and a monk came to visit this guy. And the guy's home and the, the guy said, the monk said to the guy, where did you get that rock from? And the guy said, which rock? That rock? The guy said, I don't know what to do with those rocks. My entire backyard is covered with those rocks. The guy said to him that, do you know that you have the rarest diamond in your backyard? I hope you guys are listening. So the guy who sold his property to go find diamond, he was sitting on acres of diamond and he gave up his life searching for what he already had. One of the greatest gifts that you can give to yourself is the gift of awareness. Because when you are aware of yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, your gaps, then that's the time that you can recognize your opportunity. You know, many of us, we are saying that we are missing opportunities. No, you're not missing them. You're not seeing them. Because you don't know how good you are at what you're good at. So when they come to you, guess what? You miss it because it looks different to you. This guy saw rocks when real and truly he was sitting on diamonds. When, and that goes back, and I said this morning, and I meant it that leadership is really leading up, leading down, leading across, and most importantly, leading yourself. And many of us, we miss out on that opportunity. And when we talk about, we talk about collaboration and, and awareness, now is that one of the big things that happens to us sometimes, this is what happens to us. When we move to something that is new, in everything that you do that it's new, it has some sense of discomfort that comes with it. But the more you do it, the more comfortable you get at doing it. What happens to us most time is that when we hit the hard phases, we turn our backs on our purpose. And we forget that our purpose is our compass that drives us to our prosperity. But many times we allow our plans to take the place of our purpose when really and truly our plans are just our maps. And no matter how good the map is, if you don't know where the coordinates are, you're still lost. You are lost if you are in this space and somebody say where you are and you say I'm here. Where is here? You know guys, I, I, as, I, as, I, as I connect with leaders, whether spiritual leaders, congregational leaders or whoever, one of the greatest blind spots that we have is taking the time to confront who we are. One of the main reasons why we fail, our time is up? One of the main reasons why we fail and fail big is, is because we constantly remain in a space we don't want to go forward. And I know that I have people here because every time I speak this, Every time I speak like this to groups, afterwards people come back to me and say, Jamie, you're talking to me. I'm going to use the trend and, say, and, feel, and feel as if I know that I have some people here I'm talking to. And I'm talking to myself here now. Sometimes we allow our spirituality to rob us of the opportunities that God has created within us. You know, sometimes we, we say things like, if God wants me to do it, he show me a sign. 
So this is what I say to you. So I walk up to the person and said, okay, so I'm telling you that you're good at singing. Can I not be a sign from God? What kind of sign are you waiting for? I guess, I, I know, I don't want a Jonah experience. I don't want to go in no whale's belly. That's me. So once somebody walk up and say, Jamie, you could do that. I say, really? Okay. And I'm going to go with it. So, so what happens is that we find ourselves in a space whereby it's your sweet spot. You know what happens in the sweet spots? We stay there. We lullaby. We lullaby. But, but, you, but, but what do you think about it though? And I, you know, when I talk about failure, when I talk about awareness, when you go to some place, you see some old guys and they're sitting to the back of their houses. They have their pipe in their mouth. They're not speaking as much. And if you get a chance to talk with them, what they will you say to you that I'm disappointed in myself? What are you disappointed? The grandkids are running around. They're not talking. You know what? I had a lot of opportunities in life to do a lot of things. And I didn't do it because I was so fearful of failing. And I was waiting from, for that sign from God to move forward. You see, God has given everybody a certain amount of gift. And you have to take that jump and know that you will fail. Let me, let me, let me help you guys here. Wives who are holding husbands back. Husbands who are holding wives back. Friends who are holding friends back. Listen to me clearly. You will fail, you must fail, you shall fail. So if you're planning on doing something new and your fear is failure, go for it. I'll repeat that. If you are planning on doing something for your church, for your group, for your business, for your relationship, for your career, for your education, and you are fearful of fearing, now is your time to do it. Because when you do it with fear in mind, then you can celebrate that it's God who did it. You see, sometimes we want to have all the pieces figured out before we do it. There's no cookie cutter made path for getting to where you need to be. You see, it's sometimes going to take sleepless nights, whatever it is. But for those who just joined us, we talk about the power of collaboration and how important it is for us to connect with people in order for us to win and win big. And then we segue in one of the chapters of the book. We talk about the gift of awareness and the fact that if you don't know yourself, you can't grow yourself and that you may be on the right highway heading in the wrong direction. You know what? In the story is told of two guys, and you might have heard it before, whereby they were sent to an island to sell shoes. And they, 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 their, their agent sent them there. Else, and they were there and they jumped off the plane and they, they got on a small ride and it took them to the countryside. And when they looked, Elta... They had two truckloads of shoes. When they looked, the guy said, oh my goodness, these guys don't wear shoes. He jumped to the plane and said, guy, you got to get me a ticket. The boss here, come on back to Chicago. Come back. Next flight. So the boss called the next guy the next day and said to him that, so why aren't you not coming home? The guy said, are you crazy? None of these guys wear shoes. That means that I have great business here. You see, when you are aware of where you are, when you are aware of who you are, it makes a difference in terms of the steps that you take. That's it. The next guy, he only wanted to make money. This guy was a real bona fide salesperson. So he saw this as an opportunity while the next person saw it as an edge, whereby this is going to be the end of my career if I once take this offer up. But guess what happens? You want to think about it. This is how I think about it. When you're journeying in life, if you made it midway in the ocean and you turn back, you're going to do the same distance as if you had continued. Oh, you get me. I'll, I'll put it, let, let me put it back. So, so this is me and this is, the end, this is my destination where I'm trying to get to, right? And I find myself in the middle of it. I'm in school and I'm in the middle of it and I feel like quitting. I'm in a relationship, I'm in the middle of it and I feel like quitting. I'm a church, I'm in the middle of it, and I feel like quitting. I'm in a business deal, I'm in the middle of it, and I feel like quitting. But it took me six steps to get here, and six steps to get backwards. But if I stayed here, it would be the same six, six steps to get me to the end. So, so many times what we do, we allow the hardship in the middle to stop us from getting to the next side. And we prevent ourselves from getting to where we need to be. When people talk about leadership, I, I look at it so simple, Elta. Leadership for me is just influence and believing in who you are and use all the energy and resources that you have to move towards it. In this state right here where I'm at, I may never ever make another dollar. 
or the gift that I've given to my kids if I've never they've seen something that will allow them to move forward that's it so they'll be able to say that my daddy did this so I could go further but if I didn't they'll say my daddy never did that I ain't going no further I'm scared of water my family don't like swimming he is up there they don't swim because of what they've observed so when we think about collaboration when we think about awareness I beg you before the week is out get your behavioral assessment see where your strengths are because you'll be surprised that many of us in this church we are performing below par you know this is how you know when you're performing below par when you see somebody doing something and you find yourself holding a tinge of jealousy because you know that's something that you could do when you hear somebody singing that song you're like i could hit that note i could see myself doing that when you see somebody doing you're like i know i could do that that's when you know that there's something that you have failed to act on in your life and it's holding you back you know the good thing about it zig zagler said that and i'm paraphrasing i don't remember i can't remember it he said something to the form form that if you want to be great the first step is that you got to take to be great you got to start somewhere now is the time for you to start it don't hold back and when i'm talking to you guys i, I know that i'm going to say something here and i'm not being arrogant can you guys allow me to say something i know that what i'm saying is good no i'm going to say it again i know that what i'm saying is good we know what's even better for me that doesn't matter much to me if when we're done you guys will use what i'm saying and push yourself forward that's it it means because for me my greatest gift and calling is to add value to people's life and inspire change that's it nothing satisfied me more than when somebody comes and say Jamie guess what you know what i've 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 gotten that new job i've gone back to school i've dropped out of school and started my business i'm doing these things my relationship is working much better i feel more confident in what i'm doing i have greater clarity that's a fulfillment that i receive when i have these conversations so when i have these sometimes i'm having these talks with groups and i'll ask a leader who i'm working with and i'll say can i say something up front if you're not planning and acting on what i'm saying walk out the room because what i'm saying here i'm speaking for myself you know it was and when henry can tell you guys about this when i was having my struggles it was maybe jamie 6 now jamie is going to be 6 it was 7 years ago i was in new york city and i was at my aunt's house and christmas was going well i had what you call a great job you know insurance and everything taken care of nice car beautiful wife and and two kids and and um i felt like i was there and then that that sense of emptiness start taking creep creeping in on me i get up in the night i remember one night i get up and i said to my wife i, I just can't do this and she would can't do what shauna was like you have everything that you need get me you have a house everything i said i just don't feel fulfilled i walked into um, the principal's office at that point and after the review i said that, i said to myself I, i i i think i can do more Henry and I was having a conversation once I think I was coming from somewhere we were talking I'm like there's more calling on my life than what I'm currently doing It was hard for me to say that because sometimes when you speak the truth to yourself other people may think that you're being ungrateful I repeat that sometimes when you speak the truth over your life others may think that you're being ungrateful they may be telling you that why do you want more And, and 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 but but the thing about it that life is dynamic you're always growing and moving and the minute you get comfortable where you are that's when they should be telling you why are you settling for so little you know you know this person nobody really says that elder why are you settling for that little you know you should be satisfied so anyhow i had a conversation with myself i got up in the middle of the night and and think this is the first time i'm sharing this in any public forum like this and and um i got up and couldn't sleep that night and um moving around call a few friends and got up and I think um late in the night I got up and I took up my computer and I don't know if you guys know this guy he's di- he has died uh Miles Monroe the Dr. Miles Monroe took up his vi- I took up the computer and found him when I was listening to him he had a video we were just audio he was saying that the cemetery is the is the wealthiest place on earth oh my goodness that killed me look look guys I'm telling you that killed me what I mean killed me I fe- look I've never felt a uh, felt lower than I felt at that point because right there God brought in front of me all the opportunities that I'd skipped because I wanted to be in a comfort zone all the people that I failed to connect with because I didn't want challenges I just wanted a sweet easy path forward 
And I got up, I, I, I got up and I started listening to his video. I listened all the way in the morning. Then I, I said to my wife, and Shauna said, you're going to go on that path. I, I need to do something different. And at that point, I started embracing doing more speaking, which I, I enjoy doing. And I say this to people that don't believe me. Most times when I'm about to speak, I feel butterflies still. I'm going to share this with you. Not because you're feeling butterflies. It doesn't mean that it's not your calling. Sometimes the butterflies are meant to keep you humble. God is letting you know that you can mess up the minute you choose not to trust me. So every time I, I, every time I get a chance to connect, I consider it an awesome opportunity. And the butterflies and the jitters and everything, I just consider it as God telling me that you're so called for this, I have to keep angels in your tummy to let you know that I'm still in it. So when, so when you think of, when you think about your life, when you think about the power of collaboration, and for those who are just joining, we're talking about the power of collaboration. We're talking about the gift of awareness. And the fact that the gift of awareness allows you to know yourself. And we said that if you don't know yourself, you can't grow yourself. And that you may be on the right highway heading in the wrong direction. And guess what happened? Not only you may be doing that, but you may be in the right group with the wrong people. You know, I did something for a, for a company yesterday. And I'm trying to find it. I'm trying to find something that I say, but, but, but it comes like this. Just remember this. And if you forget anything else, I wish you guys were taking notes, but that's all right. I think they're recording it. Not every train is heading in your direction. Not every applause were meant for you. And not because you have a productive church means that you're being productive. Not because you have a great team means that you're contributing to their results. And not because you're gifted means that you're producing gifts. And that, not because you're here, doesn't mean that your expiration date to the back of your neck is not ticking. You see, I remember once somebody said to me, Jamie, do you have an expiration date to the back of your neck? Or what are you talking about? He said, Jamie, some of us operate like canned foods. So what do you mean by that? He said, canned food means that you have a date, you, you're about to, you, some of us are just waiting to be eulogized. You, I, some of us are waiting to be eulogized. If you have... Okay, let me ask you a question. If, if a cat dies, they bury it, right? If something is no longer good, you throw it out, right? So if you have gifts you're not using, what should you do with them? So it means then that you are a gift of yourself. And if you are not acting on your gift, it means that you're dying slowly. It means that you have an expiration date to the back of your neck. And it means that your days are numbered and you're just waiting to be eulogized. But because I don't want to be in the eulogized line or, or pew, I act on my gifts. And how do you act on your gifts? You act on your gifts by collaborating. I'm going to, can, I'm going to point you out just for pointing sake. Is that okay? So you may be the greatest accountant in this room. But a room full, filled with accountants are still better than you as a single accountant. That's the power of collaboration. It means that no matter how good you are on the drums, on the keys, on writing, whatever it is, if you choose to connect with the right group and collaborate, it means that your value will increase exponentially. Now, guess what? Your value will pave the way for you moving forward. But when you sit in the corner with your skill and your talent, as I said this morning, talent win games, but teamwork wins championships. You could win a great game. Allen Iverson was one of my favorite players. But nobody talked about him much because he didn't beat the Lakers when they played in that finals. <laughs> practice, what practice, you know? So, so, so when you think about life, you think about collaboration. Let me see how much time I have left. I have four minutes left. So I'm going to share this. I have some lines that I always share. I'm going to share this. Remember this. When you collaborate... When you are aware of where you are, you will fail. One of my favorite lines. Quitters bounce, but winners bounce back and follow through. You say, Jamie, why do I say it like this? If when you fail and when you quit and you bounce back to where you were, you're in the same position. But if when you bounce back, you end up falling through, it means that if you fail again, you have, you have failed a step higher than where you were before. So quitters bounce, but winners bounce back and follow through. Second one is this. The muscle for being successful is self-discipline. Nothing more, nothing less. 
Being able to persevere no matter the hardship that you're facing is what keeps you winning. And the third one is this. Sometimes you have to ditch your plan and embrace your purpose. If you say to me that, Jamie, you need to go to New York to make a million dollars and my car is no longer working. I'm going to find myself in the woods catching me some good deers and I'm going to jump on one of those bad boys back. I'm going to ride my way to New York. Because my purpose is not hooked in the car that I'm going to drive. My purpose is in New York City, so I'm not going to allow the lack of having a car to stop me from getting there. You're going to see me on I-95 asking for a glass of cold water. I'm tired, but I'm going because my purpose is not in my vehicle. My purpose is in where I'm heading. But many times what happens is that we allow our planning to take the place of our purpose and we forget that we can be agile, we can shift, we can pivot, we can reflect, and we can push forward. Guys, I think my time is done, but guess what? Whenever I connect with groups, I like for you guys to be my family. So please look me up on Instagram. And it's Jamie, J-A-Y-M-I-E-P-O-T-T-I-N-G-E-R, Pottinger. And you can check me out on every other platform. And please, let's be friends. Because once we, have, once we have spent the same time in the same space, we have shared the same air, you can't take that back from me. <laughs> so, so please, so please, let's be friends. Look me up. Those of you who want to type it up, it's J-A-Y-M-I-E-P-O-T-T-I-N-G-E-R. And when you get a chance, after sunset, jump on Amazon and grab yourself off my latest copy of the book, the face of leadership. The face of leadership is an eight-part framework that deals with failure, foresight, awareness, confidence, clarity, energy. And guess what, guys? No matter how good you are, if you can't hit that bullet, which is execution, you can't win. So being prepared for it without taking the steps to achieve it will stop you from getting it. Guys, love you guys loads and loads. It was a power and a plum pleasure connecting with you guys this afternoon.